So hello, everyone. And uh, I joined Wendy in welcoming you to this webinar on documenting graduates' experiences in participatory governance in reflections on case study development. Um, I am Julian Landry. I am a program staff here at the Cody International Institute in the thematic area of uh, promoting accountable democracies, which is one of our key areas of work. And uh, Wendy and I will be supporting our three main presenters today, who are Barbara Shitnan Maigari, Bumiraj Chapagain, and Peter Ocheng. I'll provide a bit more of an introduction to them uh, as we move along this webinar. So first, we just want to provide you with a bit more context for this webinar, um, which we are calling a virtual learning forum. Uh, indeed, uh, we uh, try to have these kinds of learning events uh, here at the Cody uh, on a regular basis as part of ongoing learning as a learning organization and to tap into uh, opportunities for co-learning with graduates, with participants as, as they are here. We wanted to open this up uh, into the virtual space, and so we're using this webinar as. Uh, I, do, yeah. I want to listen. Yeah. I'll be there downstairs. One of the components of, of the context for this webinar is that um, it is part of a Cody Fellowship. So one of our key uh, yeah, 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 of programming, yeah. as, as yeah. part of our educational programming, is this uh, fellowship for you program, yesterday. whereby we invite. Cody graduates. No, no, be the one I've been sending for you. I never for listening to your own. Here in Antigua, and, and spend some time the, the, working um, on their um, own reflections, their own thinking, their own research, um, and they are supported by uh, Cody ah. staff to develop some learning products. Some public, they can be publications, they can be online um, tools or, or what have you, connected to uh, their reflections and their work. So this is uh, falls within a fellowship uh, that the three presenters are are a part of um, over the month of March. This webinar falls under the thematic area of promoting accountable democracies, which, as I mentioned, is one of the three um, key thematic areas, along with strengthening local economies and building resilient communities, that the Cody uh, focuses on in 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 uh, much of its programming. Um, promoting accountable democracies is concerned with issues of governance, issues of citizen voice, um, of, in, of ensuring accountability in governance structures and systems, and uh, our programming in the area of uh, citizen-led accountability, advocacy, um, peace, peace building uh, fall under this, this area. So this ties into the kinds of experiences that our presenters uh, do have in the field. And finally, um, this is uh, going to reside as a learning uh, product. The uh, the recording of this virtual learning forum will live on our Cody Connects Graduate Learning Network, which we've just launched. So those of you who are graduates and, and other friends of the Cody Institute have access to this uh, learning network. And we look forward to carrying on conversations there that we may start today or may have started already. This particular fellowship is tied to a project that Cody has been involved with uh, since 2016 called Participedia. Now, Participedia is an online platform. Um, it is a collaboration between over 30 different institutions and organizations uh, across the globe that are interested in mobilizing knowledge around participatory governance, democratic innovation. Um, Participedia is housed at the University of British Columbia but brings together uh, a wide range of researchers, practitioners, thinkers, and doers around uh, democratic practice and, and governance issues. The idea is that we know that all across the globe there are countless examples of people pushing the boundaries of, of, of uh, de democracy and voice and, and making governance spaces and structures um, more accountable, more participatory. And the platform aims to capture these stories. Um, the main means by which it does this is through um, the collection and collation of case studies. And so Participedia offers, I think, uh, over 800 case studies now from around the world of um, 
participatory political processes that, that go beyond the ballot box. This, uh, the contribution that Cody is making to this project is, is quite unique in that we are, we're not doing secondary research to, to contribute to this platform. We are instead engaging our graduates who are doing this work in the field to document their own experiences as Participedia case studies and, and, and feed that into, into the platform. So the purpose of this virtual learning forum is um, first to foster ongoing exchanges about participatory development approaches. And in particular, in this case, we're talking about um, those approaches that, that fall within uh, governance issues. We uh, are using this as an opportunity to highlight the uh, excellent contributions and the, and the great work of, of some of our graduates' work and to support the ongoing learnings uh, of graduates. So through this process, um, the conversations are continuing, the reflections are continuing, and, and we um, are hoping that ongoing learning is had by all who are joining us today. Um, I should mention that uh, today we are joined by three graduates who are contributing to this Participedia project. Um, there are over 15 graduates currently involved in, in the Participedia uh, project at the moment, just to, by way of context. So what are we going to do today? Um, after this brief introduction, we will move right into uh, the three presentations from our fellows. We'll first hear from Barbara Megari, um, who will tell us about her experience engaging citizens as observers in the, uh, in the courts in two states of Nigeria um, and taking a social accountability approach to uh, ensuring that Nigeria's judicial sector is uh, accountable, transparent, and uh, providing the uh, service and the rights that it, that it is um, that it is supposed to. We'll then uh, hear from Peter Ocheng from Uganda, who uh, will tell us the story of how persons with cerebral palsy in, in Uganda have self-mobilized to ensure their meaningful participation, not only in communities uh, in Uganda, but also within the disability movement. So what does it mean uh, to uh, meaningfully participate and meaningfully include different groups that are sometimes excluded amongst the excluded. And thirdly, we'll hear from Bumi Chapaging from Nepal, who will uh, tell us uh, his, about his experience in building the relationship, uh, opening up lines of communication between local radio and local audiences to those radios um, in the Nepalese context and enhancing people's voice and participation in those uh, in, in that ex exchange, in that space. Once we've heard from all three presenters, we'd like to ask them to reflect a little bit, not so much on the experience that they have documented as a case study, but rather the experience of coming here to Cody and producing, um, uh, producing the case studies on the process of developing learning resources um, around their case study. So we'll hear just a few minutes from each of them on their reflections uh, on their learning before opening it up for a discussion. Um, at, at the discussion uh, period, we'll provide a, a bit more uh, instruction on how we'll proceed. But as Wendy has already said, uh, if you have questions throughout, you may want to write them down uh, for yourself and, and raise your hand at that point, or you can write them in the chat area as we go along. So I think uh, without further ado, I will pass it over to Barbara. So Barbara Maigari is a program manager with Partners West Africa, uh, Partners West Africa, Nigeria. She is a lawyer uh, and a human rights advocate she holds two law degrees, including one that specializes in human rights and international justice. So much of her work focuses on the area uh, around rule of law, human rights, gender advocacy, and so on. 
She is a graduate of the Citizen-Led Accountability <coughs> Strategies and Tools Certificate uh, from 2016, and uh, she will tell you uh, about her experience. Over to you, Barbara. Thank you, Julian. So I would um I would like to tell you about what my organization, Partners West Africa Nigeria, and Partners Global collaborated, and how we collaborated with justice actors um, to provide solutions to challenges in the judiciary through evidence-based data. While during that project, we're also able to notice that there are problems here, but there are people within the system that are willing to see that the problems actually change and work. So just a little bit about the context, the Nigerian context. Um, for a period of time and for some years now, there have been allegations and assumptions of judicial corruption in Nigeria. In some survey by the, one of the national uh, surveys carried in 2002 by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, it was rated that 77% of lawyers and 43% of court users were approached to pay bribes. Again, in a recent survey also by the Transparency International 2018, it was indicated that 66% of Nigerians say the judiciary is corrupt. So trying to show a poor um, public perception of the judiciary. One other issue again that has been um, in, the, in the forefront is the neglect also by the executive and the legislator to actually fund adequately for the judiciary. So, Based on that, what then did we do? We took advantage of the anti-corruption agenda of the Nigerian government when it resumed in 2015 to start up a project. And the project was funded by the US Embassy, particularly the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, which uh, lasted from 2006 to 2017. We decided to take up a project to use um, to do, carry out a COPS observation across two states, the Federal Capital Territory, which is the capital of Nigeria, and Kano State, which is a um, commercial city in the north. And what we did to contribute in reforming the judicial sector was to deploy 30 observers in courts in the Federal Capital Territory, particularly 15 common law courts, while in Kano State we deployed 47 observers in 47 Sharia and common law courts to basically observe processes, procedures, and then to also monitor cases, anti-corruption and non-anti-corruption cases. So how did we go about this? First, we, we identified the stakeholders. Some of our stakeholders were the Nigerian Bar Association in both states, civil society organizations, the media, and then importantly, the Nigerian state that we were going to use particularly that we're deploying as observers and supervisors. After which we carried out an advocacy visit um, to the judiciary in FCT and also in Kano State. And then we informed them about the project, sought their support. And then we carried out a methodology workshop with experts. The picture is here, here shown, showing the different experts we engage with across the justice sector. Um, looking at different issues, people from both states came in and other states also. Then we did a DEX review of the Nigerian judiciary from 1999 to 2016 to understand what is the context. Let's have an overview since the return of democracy and up to the time the project was um, started. And then at the same time, we also did the selection of court observers. We selected across the two states and then train the observers particularly on what to do. So basically their assignment was to go into the courts, observe the cases, procedures, uh, to understand for us what is the context um, there. And to help us out, we were aimed at assessing efficiency of the courts, also to assess accountability, accessibility for people, how are people able to access the system. Um, also, we tried to do a user satisfaction survey where we try to understand 
the users of the courts, plaintiffs, defendants, litigants, lawyers, what do they experience? And then another thing we also tried to observe was independence of the judiciary, the judges sitting in each of the courts, based on the observer's uh, understanding and also uh, the court users. So we balance the observer's reports with the court users to understand uh, some of these uh, issues. And then finally, what we did was after each quarter, three, three, three times um, in a year, we did that for the period of the project, we would collate the data and then analyze it. And findings of the um, observation will present it first to the judiciary in both states and then will release to the public. The picture caption here just shows you one of the public release where we had in Abuja, FCT, the Federal Capital Territory, engaging with uh, participants and also the members of the judiciary and other stakeholders. We present to them and we get um, um, questions and then people's views on how we can contribute to reforming the system. So what were some of our major findings? Um, one of some of our major findings were one of it is that we noticed that there's a bit of um, poor diligence to duty across. Now, one of the assumptions when we started the project, and as it is, is that um, the judiciary is seen as responsible for all the challenges within the sector. However, for our, our report has been able to prove with the data presented that almost everybody in the sector responsible so from prosecutors to defense lawyers from you know judiciary themselves that's judges um, even litigants themselves and lawyers belonging to the bar association are also um, responsible for some of the challenges we also noticed the issue of as highlighted as one of the problems inadequate budgetary allocation to the judiciary which is a challenge so you find that facilities are not as adequate as, as expected um, another thing we also found out was poor, not so sufficient, but poor legal services at the common law courts across both states. However, interestingly, we noticed that access to justice was more visible for litigants that were accessing the Sharia courts. And also, we observed um, the lack of political will by the executive and the legislature to address some of this uh, problem. So at the end of it all, once we do this release of findings to both the judiciary and the public, we still develop policy briefs and then submit such policy briefs to the policy makers, suggesting our own recommendations for some of these challenges that we noted. Apart from that, at the end of the project, we still try to, uh, we noticed that there were, there were people, judges that were diligent in their work and we decided to commend some of them and give them an award. So a picture here just shows the chief judge of the FCT being presented with an award. What are our outcomes? Um, we've noticed broadly, these are the major outcomes uh, in the project, increased accountability and transparency. So for now, we know that um, recently, the, ch the chief judge of Nigeria has released an order in indicating an directing that court should sit, judicial officers should try to sit in time. We also need to, we try to also increase transparency because observers were able to access case files. Again, we, we note that uh, it has also enhanced credibility for organizations that work on justice sector issues. So we know that now Partners West Africa Nigeria is an important stakeholder in justice sector issues. Again, we try to see that the project doesn't just end after the project itself, but it continues even when the funding stops. So we try to develop a court observation app as a sustainability approach, which is right here um, for people to use. So the app is currently being used by uh, different organizations, different stakeholders that work on such um, justice sector issues. We also use the app by our current, some of our projects for people to also observe and we analyze the data and present to, to different stakeholders. This is a picture of one of our engagement. This picture just shows you the way we collaborated with different justice sector actors. You have the international community, our partners in DC. You also have the Nigerian Association here, prisons, the Federation of Women Lawyers, uh, civil society organizations. 
So importantly, what do I want you to take from here? That early and strategic collaboration can bring desired results. We, we, we started collaboration from the beginning and it continued till the end. And up till now, we're still collaborating with those stakeholders. Again, so we believe that evidence-based data is a strong contributor to reforming the system. And we also believe, based on our mission, that a system can change when the people are willing. Because some of the people, while we we're working, were willing to see that the thing would work. A lot of them wanted to work with us. Um, they weren't hesitant at all. So for more information, if you want to know about my organization, Partners West Africa Nigeria, you can please look up to us on this website, www.partnersnigeria.org. And our emails are also here. Once you get to the website, you would see our email and then our social media platform communication. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara, for uh, that great example of, of, of how, uh, you know, everyday citizens can actually uh, have a meaningful contribution when they are engaged in, as you mentioned, a strategic and collaborative uh, approach to engage with uh, different service providers and particularly the role that citizens can play in generating uh, reliable and credible data where, there, where, where it doesn't exist and data that, that eventually contributes to greater transparency and, and ultimately accountability. So um, some, some useful lessons there uh, from Nigeria. From Nigeria, we will now go to Uganda and hear from Peter Ocheng. Peter is a, a scholar at un the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom, currently pursuing a master's of international and European human rights law. He is um, a 2016 Cody Diploma graduate and has been a volunteer with the Uganda National Association of Cerebral Policy since 2011. Uh, so he will tell you now about uh, the experience that he has had in that capacity with uh, with the uh, National Association or UNAC, as the shorthand goes. Over to you, Peter. Oh. Thank you, Julian. Uh, I'm going to present to you my case study on uh, passive passive self mobilizing for meaningful participation in Uganda. The content of my presentation is Master's in Cerebral Palsy within the Ghana Comics, the Ghana National Association of Cerebral Palsy, Inclusion of Persons in Cerebral Palsy, the Challenges, and I will make some conclusions. Over the years, Persons in Cerebral Palsy and their family members we are marginalized both in the disability movement and in the general community. This was partly because the community believes that cerebral palsy is caused by character aspects such as curses, misfortunes, or unfaithfulness in marriage. While in the disability community, they, they believe that since persons with cerebral palsy manifest other kinds of disability, like physical disability. Those people from such categories could represent their views. In Uganda, the constitution, the disability to 2006, and as a signatory with the UNCRPD, discrimination on basis of disability is generally prohibited. However, this couldn't guarantee inclusion of persons with cerebral palsy in their community activities. So, in 2011, we, decide, we decided to start mobilizing persons with cerebral palsy, empowering them to realize their rights and to claim their space for inclusion in all community activities. So, 
what happened. In 2011, two youths were identified, they were empowered, they were trained in leadership and project management, and were entrusted to lead a, a pilot project that aimed at mobilizing persons with in the communities of Kampala and Wakiso in central Uganda. At the end of the pilot project, 142 members were mobilized. In order to sustain these efforts, it was resolved to register an organization, which is the Uganda National Association of Cerebral Palsy in 2013. Uh, as you can see in this photo, this is one of the mobilization activity carried out in, in Lira District. You can see a mix of persons with cerebral palsy and other categories of disabilities and people with disabilities. The, the, the trick UNAC uses is that we rely on contact people in the communities to lead us to families of persons with cerebral palsy because since they are marginalized and ex excluded in the community, it is very hard to reach them and identify them. So once persons with cerebral palsy were mobilized, they are trained in advocacy and and also they were trained in realizing their rights. This was important because most of them didn't know that they have rights like other people in their community to be included in their community activities. And it was also important to empower them to promote these rights and to uphold them and to ensure that they continue to participate in the community even after the project ended. It was also important for us to mobilize allies, whereby we identified disabled persons organizations. We also formed other non-government organizations and government departments, which helped us to push our initiative of claiming space for inclusion of persons with disabled plastic in all their community activities. But since our project were targeting specific areas and we aimed at raising awareness to the whole country, we also used media campaigns like radio talk shows, TV talk shows, we produced brochures and other IEC materials to ensure that we can reach a, a bigger audience. As a result of this initiative, two youth with several persons joined the National Union of Disabled Persons Youth Committee in Uganda. This is a committee that brings the voice of all youth with disabilities in Uganda. This was important because most persons with cerebral palsy are youth, and uh, it is important that they, they really get involved in issues concerning youth and also benefit from distinct youth interventions in their communities. So also, some youth, some persons with disabilities who became very empowered, became local leaders in their community, local councils. The, their journey in local council guaranteed that now persons with disabilities in their communities are aware of different government programs going on in their communities and they also testify that their peers in the council give them time to speak and also accessibility is being improved in these local councils. The family members this was actually a testimony from the local leaders that as a result of awareness raising, now they are able to also tap the members of persons with cerebral palsy 
because the community now can associate with them. There's those changing attitude in the community whereby people believe that Sebo person is a disability which is not contagious. However, let's find the, our this initiative and its effort, the politicizing of participation in Uganda hinders effective inclusion of persons with cerebral palsy in their communities. Because in some communities, if you don't support the government, they don't include you. And in other communities, if you, if you support the government, they, they automatically exclude you. So it is still com complicated for this initiative to fully guarantee participation of persons with cerebral palsy. We are also facing competition from other disabled persons organizations and other NGOs for the shrinking funding opportunities. And also the dependence on donors compromise our ability to push mainly for political participation of persons with cerebral palsy. So, from this initiative, we realized that, and I would, all, I would also expect you to appreciate that uh, within, within the marginalized community, there are some people who are further marginalized. Because persons with disabled persons, they are even marginalized within the disability community where they could seek refuge. And also, it was important that persons with cerebral palsy take lead of this initiative from the initiative from the in the inception of the initiative there were persons with cerebral palsy even the photo i showed you most of those people are persons with cerebral palsy who are leading the initiative and that really changed the attitude of the community and their family members and even persons with cerebral palsy to become empowered to accept themselves and also to push the initiatives. And also, by granting participation of the marginalized people or excluded people in the community, the benefit always goes beyond the targeted people because he targeted persons is of us, but now their family members are also included in their community activities. So thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, again, um, a, a, a quite inspiring story of um, a group of, of marginalized people or people who were excluded amongst the excluded who found a way to create space and uh, elevate their own voices. It's a uh, it, it, it's a good reminder to uh, it, it's a good reminder to us all that that in uh, in in many cases we we need to think about who is uh, who is at the table and and who isn't at the table and and who do we not even think about when we think about the table. So um, thank you for that th those lessons on on inclusion, Peter. Uh, from Uganda now, we are going to go over to Nepal, just around the corner. Um, Bumiraj Chapagain uh, is the co-founder and manager at Sharecast Initiative Nepal. And uh, he has over 15 years of, of experience working with community radio. He is uh, currently contributing to the Association of Community Radio Broadcasters Nepal as an audit committee coordinator. Bumi is a 2015 Diploma in Development Leadership graduate uh, here at the Cody International Institute. He holds a master's in population and development studies. Bumi, over to you. Thank you so much, Julian. Uh, this is Bumi Chapagain from Nepal. Uh, now I'm going to talk about local radios in Nepal. 
particularly i am going to talk about how share caste initiative nepal supported to local radios to enhance people's participation in local radio in nepal first i would like to share about the context what's the nepalese radio context in nepal uh, nepal is pioneer in south asia for fm radio now we have more than 740 radios already have license by the end of 2017 and uh, radio is credited to with improving political and part participation of deepening democracy in nepal and nepal is a, a diverse country diversity in caste ethnicity language religion uh, culture so many things and with a very low literacy like 66 uh, percent people are literate and among them uh, 39 percent are with primary level educations uh, beside this radios are not going on here with adequate audience information like audience demographic and uh, uh, social composition information audience profile and their need and interest this is why the audience size is decreasing day after day uh, it is it was recorded in 2013 that 92% total audience were uh, in 2013 and it is decreased to 72% by the end of 2016 and the daily, daily listeners also decreasing from 60% to 35% so the other challenges is sustainability challenge uh, very roughly more than 75% radios are in crisis and uh, uh, the recent uh, data revealed that 32% radios were already shut down and 47 radios were failed to renew their license this is the context uh, the another uh, why this initiative is surecast initiative uh, nepal uh, initiate a uh, uh, programs to address these challenges to uh, strengthen local radios and respond to listeners priorities so circus work to bridge audiences with local radios through data transparency multiple layers of data from multiple corner and circus uh, work to engage radio operators and staffs to participate in the process and it was pilot with 10 local radios from uh seven provinces we have we have a cycle of activities we have done four different activities during this project period we have done media and democracy democracy survey short analysis workshop abcd workshop program redesign and uh, redesigning workshop it's kind of cycle but demand driven cycle not donor or project driven cycle uh, now I would like to share some glimpse of audience survey over here. Uh, we have done annual media and democracy survey since 2015. Uh, the survey was conducted to understand citizens' perspective on media and democracy in Nepal. The audience, the respondent size was different from 4,000 to 5,555, and it was face-to-face -face interview with uh, using a mobile device. Uh, questions related to citizens were views, opinion, and perception on current radio programs, what they are listening now. And the, another one was desired content perceptions about local government and democracy, and what they really want to listen from their local radios. The next activities was short analysis, strength, weakness, opportunities, and threat analysis. It was in-house with radio member, radio board, and entire staffs. This was done because to uh, diagnose the internal health and external opportunities of local radios. Internal health means uh, what's their internal status their management their staff their board their collaboration communication branding promotion so many things and the words they have the external opportunities from their local community and it was done to identify the possible solutions to identified issues you know so we try to find the possible solutions within uh, these groups 
and then we uh, done asset based community development approach abcd in local area it was quite a um, new pilot in this, uh, local radios it was also in house workshop with radio member radio board and entire staff staffs it was done to understand map and document local assets opportunities possible allies and collaborators around their local radios and it was done to explore what community assets they could potentially mobilize to benefit both radio and the community as well after this abcd we said we again gathered together to radio member board and entire staff it was also in house we have done this activities because ultimately audience wants programs they want to listen programs so we sit together to redesign programs uh, it was done to identify how local radio could address people's need and respond to audience interest and concerns by shifting program timing and format and the another uh, way we done this activities was to identify how radio can open multiple doors to ensure greater participation and address local problems through radio content after all these four activities we have got some good outcomes from uh, all activities the first one we got increase in community center programming like radio started to broadcast health related program education related program personal finance program programs on local governance and accountability that helps to increase their audience and that helps to increase their sustainability as well because now they are doing multiple type of collaboration with other agencies association and the organization within their community area so we have data that around 20% of audience they got and now it helped to improve participation in programmings radios increases box pop local reports lo local interviews local news and local programmings so the another outcome we got is uh, improved internal management as well after the short analysis radio listed multiple activities actions how they can overcome these uh, problems gaps and we got regular meetings now plans plans of action and strategies input output output monitoring mechanism they have and the capacity building trainings also and the reporting mechanism they have do this help them to improve their internal management and the another outcome we got uh, increased transparency and access to information now radio are linking social media platform like facebook twitter viber to uh, to get connect to their audience to receive opinion concerns voice you know and they are using website online streaming as well and that they are putting their content on port podcast as well to make available to everywhere and the another outcome was mobilized local assets for greater citizens engagement in local media like local news stories and programs archived on website and as podcast it helped them to to disseminate for the wider community globally we have got some lessons after this activities like this is evident based decision not we done not we forced to do this and that this all had done based on the data based on information about audience radio community asset all things happen by the data they were data driven decisions and the another our lesson was uh, radio local radio is a common platform for citizens voice you know without people centric uh, content and sound management local radio couldn't survive anymore for local radio participation was discovered to be a 
PWP site after this approach. And we got another lessons after this activity is local radio is a local democratic space. Still, people express honest to complain directly to elected representative, public official, and other service provider. But they feel comfortable to talk with radio to complain to put their voice opinion so local radio is a local democratic space the final we got the synchronization of multiple approaches to enhance local radio responsiveness you know we have audience survey sort abcd redesigning workshop multiple activities but own activities followed another another this is kind of cycle you know the finally we got importance of internal sustainability. First, local radio should sustain to address local priorities, concerns. The performance and sustainability of internal management and system were completely linked to radio's ability and willingness to adapt the need in their audience. Yes, this is our lesson learned. Now I complete my presentation over here if you want to know about our work if you want to more information please you can contact me you can visit our website www.surecast.org.np and you can write an email and we can discuss if you have any question or if you want to more clarity later thank you so much excellent thank you Bumi. Thank you, so again another uh, another case uh, of, of Engagement. engagement. Uh, this time, engaging uh, audiences, surfacing their preferences, their priorities, uh, generating data from different local audiences in order to ultimately be able to um, to engage the radio uh, stations as well and foster responsiveness on their sides to those priorities, to those needs. And in so doing, enhancing that relationship between radio and their audiences and ultimately creating, uh, uh, as, you, as you put it, a more, a more democratic public conversation where radio is responding to, uh, to audiences and vice versa. So thank you for, uh, for that third case. Um, we, uh, we hope that uh, that's generated a lot of interest and, and perhaps some questions, some comments, and we look forward to a discussion on that in a few minutes. Um, but before we move on to, uh, to the conversation, we wanted to spend just a few minutes um, asking our three fellows some of their reflections. Um, but their reflections on the process. So we've now heard about their experience on the ground. Now we want to ask them what they have taken away from the process of documenting that experience, in this case, in the form of a case study for Participedia. So uh, any key learnings, uh, any reflections that you have on this, um, we would look forward to a, a few thoughts on that. So perhaps we'll follow the same order. We'll start with Barbara. Uh, what are your takeaways from this experience, Barbara? Once more, Julian, thank you so much. Um, for me, when I applied last year, the interest was for me to come and document what um, we're doing at home, the work one is doing at home, but also to reconnect with old faces and new faces once more in Cody. So that was the first interest for me last year. And then coming on here, it's been a very interesting experience. Um, sometimes we tend to focus just to report to specific stakeholders. So you might be reporting for the purpose of a donor, or you might just be reporting for the purpose of a stakeholder. This time around, we've been able to develop a case study to report to everybody that is interested in listening to um, our projects at home. So the summary of our case study is on the Participedia, and I think is easily readable. Um, people can understand. We've been able to identify, you know, some of the issues that ordinarily at home we might be thinking about. So the process has really made me to critically think, to also know how to communicate to different people, and then it has also kind of improved my writing skills. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Peter, um, f what about you? On, on your end, uh, what have you taken away from this process? Uh, thank you, Julian. Uh, when I applied to this uh, fellowship, my first interest was to raise awareness about cerebral palsy because even within the disability community, people with cerebral palsy are marginalized because they are always facing multiple disabilities. So, leading an initiative from a project to an an organization now that even the government can rely on to render services to people with cerebral palsy or something very fascinating. So I believe that this could raise awareness to the public and to the to scholars and other people who are going to read this case study on how they can motivate such people to, to mobilize themselves and also to be included in the community. And uh, for me, I just appreciate Cody approach to learning because from the application still today that we are presenting to you, we have been fully supported in different ways. We have been given different exercises which help us not only to learn but also to reflect, because the reflection is always important to see that whether you are, what you are doing is meaningful or it is really causing the desired impact. And I appreciate the whole team led by Julian and other people who are being part of this initiative for the full support. And I generally thank Koji for this. And I hope that. This work, not only my work, but as a group, this work will cause some desired impact in other communities around the world. Thank you, Peter. Um, and how about you, Bumi? Uh, what uh, what are some of your reflections on this process? Uh, thank you again, Julian. Uh, first of all, this is uh, a good opportunity to me to document our case study and uh, make it available to global reference you know uh, because our initiative is not have long history just we began this in 2015 so this is our good opportunity to document and to demonstrate how we are working the another thing is uh, uh, we got good insight to write uh, uh, case study addressing multiple audiences you know so this is unique learning for me because I'm writing this case study to different audience which is completely different that I wrote before and another thing is organize kind of conduct a webinar as well this is first time that we are here sitting on this table so now this uh, webinar uh, developed my confidence to organize webinar in my context as, as well to disseminate my learnings and reflections you know so the, another thing is uh, Kodi Connect how can we disseminate our writings learnings skills in Kodi Connect and uh, another uh, learning for me is uh, working together collaborating collaboration you know that with you, with Wendy, with Catherine, and um, uh, this is really good uh, and nice takeaway for me. Thank you. Thank you all. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for for those reflections and uh, and of course for your presentations of of your work. Um, I, I know that I certainly gained a lot uh, from those experiences and, and the way that you've been able to capture those. And uh, always appreciate hearing your reflections um, as you go through the, 
the, the process of ongoing learning um, here at, at through Cody programming. I think what we'd like to do now is open up the floor, if you will, the, the virtual floor um, for some questions. And I and I have seen that uh, there's a number of questions that have already been um, written up in the chat. We will uh, we will prioritize questions that that pertain more directly to the the cases and to the content of of the cases and the discussion that we have had. Um, and I think for the conversation for the discussion, I will hand it over to Wendy, who has been uh, tabulating and keeping track of those questions to uh, to to uh, moderate that part of the conversation. So over to you, Wendy. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Julian. Um, I'm actually going to go a little bit backwards here um, because I'm going to ask the question that Aaron gave to us in the chat uh, because it, it flows a little uh, from your reflections process. So Aaron asked all three presenters uh, to comment. You have had the opportunity to peer review each other's work. Could you share what this experience was like and what the challenges and opportunities might have been? So just a few words uh, from each of you and I'll just uh, again go through the order in which we presented. So I'll ask Barb and then I'll ask and then when Barb is done, Peter. Thank you, Wendy. Um, for me, the, the most important um, learning here is the fact that you have an opportunity to come together um, to learn about um, projects that we are each implementing across our country. So if I were seated just in Nigeria, I wouldn't have known about local radio issues in Nepal. I wouldn't have known about cerebral palsy. In all honesty, it was in this learning that I knew about, specifically about cerebral palsy and in the details about it. So for me, that's the first experience with, um, with the learning. Then secondly, um, also when we were reviewing each other's um, um, case studies, it helped me also to know the context across Uganda and then across Nepal. It also helped me to appreciate the issue, the role of um, citizens' participation in governance issues. In particular, the Cerebral Palsy um, Association in Uganda the way the, um, they were able to galvanize and ensure that the people that are marginalized are the ones speaking for themselves. That was a learning tool for me, importantly for participation, that sometimes when we're talking about participation, the people that are the focus tend to not be on the discussion table. So for me, it was an important thing. And all the same thing too in the local radio, situation in Nepal too. Once more, inclusion is important. So for me, those were the major lessons. And then also writing and sharing. Sometimes it's not uh, easy. I found that we were, we tried our best to understand each other with our work. Um, we commented as much as possible. We criticized when it was necessary for the purpose of making the work look good. So for me, that was the major learning. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy, for your question. Yeah, yeah. I, really I really need the first match from Barbara. I think uh, an opportunity to come here and sit together as peers and uh, looking at each other's work. One, it it gives me an opportunity to concentrate and produce this work, you know. If you're doing the same work remotely, it, it involves other things which distract. You have office work, you have this, but it is an opportunity to commit ourselves and get the job done within a prescribed period of time. And also having the opportunity to meet with our mentors, meet with Julian, meet with Kathy, meet with Wendy, and really share with them exactly what we are trying to document and try to understand the context of what we are trying to document. It's very important for us to really document our case study and uh, 
they got some free other view. It was uh, my first time to do such an exercise whereby you exchange and you give that as comment one. I had to learn other people's context. Like, uh, and I was reading about Bumi's work in, uh, in Nepal. I felt like, wow, could this also happen in my country? So I'm not only just reading his work, but I'm also picking ideas of what maybe I can also transform in my, in my community. Yeah, so it was a great experience. Uh, thank you, Wendy. Uh, this is uh, such a good time for me uh, because I got an opportunity to learn from Peter, to learn from uh, Barbara. First, I got an opportunity to learn about Nigerian context and their work and the, how they are working to um, develop the accountability in uh, judiciary uh, court, uh, which was completely new for me because um, though I worked as a journalist uh, in Nepal for a long time, but uh, uh, this area is completely new for me. Um, uh, I was not a poor journalist before and you gave me new insight how a journalist can work uh, to make transparent or to, to make accountable to the judges and other people as well so that I can easily share your on hand experience to my journalist friends in Nepal as well. And after hearing Peter, uh, this is also a new case for me. And uh, I, I really appreciate the work, uh, how Peter has done in, in, in Uganda. So he inspired me after hearing him. And the work took work with um, all three people. I got uh, very uh, inspiring and beautiful from Barbara, from Peter, to make my writings more rich. So we review all three stories before sending you. And we try to incorporate all peer review feedbacks to make it more better. So uh, I have got very good insights hearing with hearing to peer as well and i found all cases media is a cross cutting so yes media is there in peter's case and barbara's case and so i think we can build media power or um, media things to other areas as well in nepal Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Wendy, for this wonderful opportunity for us. Thank you, fellows. Okay, thank you, fellows. I am going to, am going to scroll, scroll up through the chat and, now and uh, sift through our questions. The first one uh, came to Barbara from Anthony, and uh, he asked or I made the comment in some other African countries, growing public disenfranchisement with and distrust of the formal judicial system has prompted many to turn to traditional justice systems. Is this happening in Nigeria other than the Sharia system? And how does your organization view this scenario? For example, is it considered an opportunity or a threat? Thank you, Wendy. Um, I, I think um, for Nigeria, we have um, a different context. So in, in majority of the states, especially in the North, you have a combination of common law practice, you have Sharia law, and you have the traditional justice system. However, across other states, you have the a traditional justice system and common law system. So um, it's not as if the traditional justice system has collapsed per se, it's still there. Uh, the common law system is there. However, yes, there are issues of, as I said, as my case study showed, particularly for Nigeria, issues of um, public trust is dwindling, issues of uh, accountability on previous uh, you know, practices. So some of these cases arise, some of these situations arise, but it also de it depends on how the judiciary or any government institution is accountable to the people. So it's based on what people see uh, and then the services they receive 
effectiveness of such service delivery that you know they will be able to gauge what is happening so basically for i can't, I can't speak generally for uh, some other countries i can only speak for my own country so basically that's what i what i know currently it's happening thank you barbara so the uh, there's another question in here, and this one is directed at Bumi. Uh, Anthony asks, uh, made the comment that your presentation seems to assume that community radio is inherently democratic and progressive, but there are other examples from different countries where community radio actually serves to surface and amplify ethnic divisions and conflict. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. yeah, Nepal is also multi uh, caste ethnic and multi religious um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, multicultural country. Uh, we have uh, more than 740 radios. But in our context, uh, not uh, local radios are playing role to divide community, uh, but they are trying to uh develop the harmony uh, between and among the community people we don't have such experience that radios are doing uh, this kind of things in ne in nepal uh, yes so anthony i'll just, so anthony, check, I'll just check in does that address uh, your question or would you uh, like to go deeper Okay, so I'm going to ask a question uh, of Peter now, and it came through uh, from Eileen. And the question is, um, what are your thoughts about the research methods you undertook in your respective work? What community level challenges did you encounter the, in this work? And it's not necessary to answer the full question now, but it's uh, just useful to think about some of the practical ways of how we ensure community driven research. research. Forward. Forward. So just a few just words. A few words. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for our case, the biggest challenge was community attitude towards cerebral palsy. Most people view cerebral palsy as a caste, as witchcraft, and such cultural beliefs other than as a disability on its own. So to access such people in the community, even the family members could hide their children from the public. They could we found the child who had never got out of the house for 14 years of his life, but the family could go for parties, they could go for Christmas, they could go visit other guests, but they locked him up in the house. So it was just a maid who told us in the trading center that where I work, there's a child who has been hidden for several years, but don't say that I'm the one. So we found that in that case, to do to do such mobilization and to get such people, we had to contact people. We had to have identified people in the communities who have reputation, own different families, and also after interfacing with them, we also got some youth disabled persons who were empowered who could help us identify other families of people with cerebral palsy. So in that case, if you're going to have communities with such attitude, it is important that you rely on contact people, people from that area. They will give you the right information and they will lead you to those people. And also another thing which was important was to see persons with cerebral palsy mobilizing their fellow peers. Because if your mother has a child with cerebral palsy and sees me because I have cerebral palsy, it was easier for her to get out the child and let us interact with the child. Yeah, so briefly, <laughs> thank you. Excellent. Hmm. Yeah. 
in this uh, initiative uh, we called local radio uh, rather than community or commercial radio as uh, in our context uh, we from circast uh, we don't want to separate who is community or who is commercial radio so we, both radios are with us on this initiative and go, if you talk about the policy level matters in radio licensing thing in Nepal, we don't have separate policy to govern community radio and commercial radio. And uh, all the regulation, taxation, licensing provisions, all, all are similar. So uh, and we are looking just content and whether they are uh, providing uh, enough platform to participate local people or not. How many? How much the uh, local content uh, they they have in their content in 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 all broadcasting? So we talked uh, on this initiative. We talk local radio as well. Yes, just I want to address one small things uh, on your last question. We have very very little confrontation we seen um, related to the political things just before the pro promulgation of the constitution. Some agitating parties, they try to influence local radio to uh, raise their voice using the local radios. Uh, we quite political, not ethn ethnical, you know. So I don't, uh, I don't want to generalize that local radio uh, are uh, using to raise the conflict and to uh, to raise the confrontation between and among the um, other local community. Yeah. So that actually feeds into a question that Anuj asked, uh, and it's a question for all. So uh, if you have some thoughts on this from our from our participants here, um, whoever would like to reflect on the role of partnerships. Uh, for us, uh, we try to uh, do collaboration with local agencies like local uh, media house, production house, and media agencies to get uh, funding for these uh, initiatives. Uh, and the, another challenge for us is big turnover and due to out migration, you know. So this uh, uh, this is uh, challenge for us we faced during this project uh, project um, period, but we try to. Uh, develop human resource locally and the radios are also serious to do so. So uh, compared to surecast and local radio, they are more serious than us to sustain uh, this initiative locally. Thank you, Randy. Um, so Yes, sometimes you have challenges. Um, when we started the project, and I'm sure it's across when you're doing some of these type of interventions, um, you have some stakeholders that are threats, some are in support. It's the normal <laughs> game of this kind of work. However, I would want to say that um, for us, the work we've been doing, we've gotten support a lot from the different stakeholders. So the Bar Association has been supportive. The judiciary at the beginning we started this project when there were some political ups and downs in nigeria with respect to anti-corruption strategies and um, there were hesitations by stakeholders particularly the judiciary wondering what our intention was however as time went on and most most importantly because we we joined hands from the beginning with the mba the nigerian bar association and so the Bar Association introduced us to the judiciary, even though some of us are lawyers and all that, but we needed current uh, persons holding positions in the Bar Association to say, okay, these people are 
to an extent we can vouch for the, what they're doing. We've known them for a period of time and it was easier. And then the reservations um, were let down and then we started the work. Um, you, you might have positive, you might have negative. It depends on who you're engaging with. However, sometimes the challenge is the issue of sustainability and continuity with respect to the engagement you're having with stakeholders. So for governments, yes, government continuum. But if you're, if you're bringing an intervention today, what's the guarantee that the relationship you've established is, is, has, has been institutionalized, is not based on one individual? So what's the guarantee that those that we have worked with, if they move down, how are we sure that we would continue their engagement with them? I think it cuts across all the and, and projects we're talking about here. But that's one uh, challenge, you know, for us with respect to engagement with stakeholders. Thank you. Okay. To, uh, to the echo what my colleagues have said, uh, as person as a cerebral person, when we are starting as a project, it was important for us to capitalize in where the existing disabled persons organization and other NGOs who already have national coverage, they already have that awareness to see that we can also raise awareness about cerebral policy. And this is work well, for example, really put the National Union of Disabled Persons of Uganda supported us so much to see that we gain ground and confidence in like the government and other people and other governments and other donors, not just as they are supporting us originally. But as we started to grow to grow up and uh, cerebral palsy started to gain interest in the country, other partners started to also write project proposals that are also targeting persons with cerebral palsy. So instead of supporting our initiative, they became competitors. They started to become a threat on our own potential funding, started diverse, diverse our membership and so on. So at the end of the day, we just had to start forming like partnerships with them so that we do the same all related work, but we have one kind of, we give the audience one picture. We don't show the audience that maybe we are competing for the space of funding and how we've managed to manage to work through that challenge and to strengthen the partnership to benefit persons with cerebral palsy. Thank you, folks. I'm going to go to a question from Michel now. And he asked, oh, going to my screen, what are some of the most difficult challenges that you face in that? So just if you have any thoughts of that, I'll just ask one or two of you. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, sometimes the challenge we face is with respect to, there are sometimes you write proposals and your intention is to do something. And when you get to the field, there might be need for you to change because the context might permit that. Or, so I give an example. When we started the court observation project for Kano, across on our document, we were going to work in the normal common law courts. But when we got to Kano, there was need for us, to, stakeholders told us, there is no way you would only work in common law courts because we have Sharia courts that a lot of people also have access to. And so we needed to go back to the drawing board and speak with the funder. And sometimes that creates a bit of you know tension. The funder wants something else. So you have that kind of, um, um, issue arising whereby your initial objective or focus area 
is not as it is based on the context. So these are some uh, types of challenges. And then um, the development of a court observation app was in the course of the project. So there are things you see, positive things, and for us it's a positive step. We thought about it as, okay, um, if this project is going to end, what is going to be sustainability approach to it? So you might go on the field, you would see something else that might need you to change um, your initial strategy, positive, most times is to ensure that you meet up the requirements of the funder while also ensuring that the context where you work, the people, the beneficiaries also benefit. So you're doing a win-win for both parties. So there are challenges, there are ups and downs, but you always try to find a way to manage them. Thank you. And now I'm going to jump down to a question that Vicky asked um, or commented as well. Peter talked about people living with cerebral palsy being marginalized in the disability movement. And she asked if, if uh, any of the pre presenters could also comment on how other intersections of race and gender are playing out in your programs and how have they been addressed. She was wondering if the observers or the audience surveys and the in, in the ABD, ABCD process work in the AC, whether it looked at that specifically. So maybe I'll start. Uh, I, I see a lot of heads nodding here. So I'm just going to go from Peter to Barb and then to uh, Boomi. Quickly in the quickly time that we, we have, have to summarize. To summarize. Yeah, thank you. For for us. Uh, we found out that uh, most people who are affected by cerebral palsy we are women. I find that uh, a child is being kept by a grandmother, a child is being kept by a mother, and uh, a few cases where where male people are really found to be taking care of these people with cerebral palsy. So as an organization, we noticed that uh, this compromised the ability of women to engage in other activities like employment, like trade, like farming, and it made them to the poorest among the poor within their community. So in that case, we had to target them with other economic empowerment activities like startup capital, we give them Poetry and so on. So, in that case, that's how we try to see that how can we also target that gender inequality in terms of poverty to try to 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 empower women in general, not only persons with cerebral palsy. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, our focus when we started was to ensure that Nigeria, being a diverse country. We were focused on trying to have not equal but maybe equitable representation of people. So gender, of course, <laughs> was a major focus. Male, female observers across both states and also male, female supervisors across both, both states. Then with respect to uh, ethnic and religious diversity, very sensitive again in, in Nigeria, we try to balance it. Um, in both states. So in Kano, yes, you had Muslims, Christians, um, different. you had different um, ethnic groups also, and the same thing also at the FCT. So as an organization, we try to focus on doing that. It's part of us for engagement. Thank you. Yes, uh, obviously, this is a major issue. Uh, how can we engage all sections of society in our activities for us as well? Uh, our survey completely represent the census data uh, um, of uh, uh, like caste, ethnicity, gender, and all uh, dist demographic distribution, you know. So it's quite uh, similar to the census uh, distribution. Uh, in other uh, uh, activities also, uh, like ABCD, SORT, and program uh, redesigning workshop, it was quite in-house. So all people from the local radio were there. 
And while selecting the radio station, we we try to select uh, woman headed radio as well. And we try to co cover the all province province as well. We try to cover community and commercial both radios, you know. So we also try to uh, give that kind of inclusiveness in our uh, selection criteria as well. And re radio, they are also trying to represent the community um, composition in their uh, programming as well. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, folks. Um, I'm just uh, looking at our clock and being mindful that we can't get to all the questions that we have uh, floating in the chat, which is actually a really good sign because it means we've stimulated your thinking about uh, these ideas. But that actually uh, gives me the opportunity as well to um, to invite our Cody graduates to come to Cody Connects and continue the discussions that we have been having uh, there on some of the activities uh, that our Cody graduates have been doing uh, since they have left our classrooms, whether that be here in Nova Scotia or overseas or online. And one of the things that we would really love for you to do is uh, by all means, yes, to continue those conversations. We will be providing the recording of uh, today's session in, um, in Cody Connects for Cody graduates. Uh, those of you who are online today who are not Cody graduates, if you send an email to CodyConnects at stfx.ca, we can send you some details. Um, but you'll see, um, as of tomorrow, the recordings will be there. We'll have some handouts. And also in the chat, the Participedia links are there as well, so you can download those case studies. We will also have those case studies available as takeaways PDFs so that you can use them as tools as well. Um, and one of the last things that I'm going to ask um, my, uh, virtual, uh, my virtual audience to do is to take part in a very short uh, webinar evaluation. So we're asking for your feedback on how we here at the CODI and the work that we're doing uh, through our ongoing learning efforts uh, through CODI Connects can really help to address um, um, that those uh, desires and wishes of what you would like us to do and what we would like, how we can help graduates continue that ongoing learning. So in the chat, you will see a link to a, uh, a survey, and I would please need to do that. It's anonymous, and our participants here, and even Julian and myself, do not have access to the data. It is being compiled by our monitoring and evaluation uh, guru, Eric Smith, who is using it for reporting purposes for our funders and our donors. And But it's also going to be used for feedback and how we can improve what we do here for you, our Cody graduates. So I would like to take a moment to thank all of you for joining us here this afternoon. And I especially would But also the fact that they added to the fellowship their their presence in this virtual uh, in this virtual forum, and the fact that it is going to be recruited, uh, it is it is going to be used as an ongoing resource for everyone to use. And I'd like to give a special shout out as well to Catherine, uh, Catherine Irving, who has uh, done some amazing work at the beginning of uh, this process of really setting the stage for the writing process to have a case study completed before uh, before the fellowship is over and and that actually that contributed so well to the the content of today's webinar so Julian as our fellow lead for this Participedia project thank you very much for your time as well in doing this webinar today and thank you folks for joining us online look forward to seeing you in Cody connects in the future have a great day folks <laughs>